What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a peach if you find the same. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Atari, Hint Water, many more, how they overcome big challenges in life and business. This episode is brought to you by Rise25, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. Rise25's mission is to connect business owners to, to their ideal peers, customers, and referral partners. We do it in three ways. We help your company completely run and launch your own podcast that we distribute across 11 or more different channels, including a dedicated blog post per episode. So you just show up and talk and we do everything else. We do live in-person VIP days and receptions with top entrepreneurs all over the country. And we do a done-for-you lead generation service where we manage a consistent outreach to ideal clients and referral sources. This is not paid traffic, by the way. Since this requires a lot of humans to do the work, we have limited bandwidth and we only want to work with the right company. So if any of sound interesting, go to rise25.com and contact us. I am very excited. Today we have Stefan Aristol, the founder of Tower Paddleboards and the No Middleman Project. Founded in 2010 and funded by billionaire Mark Cuban, Tower Paddleboards is one of the biggest success stories in Shark Tank history. You know, Stefan, I get to brag about you because I'm me and not you, so I'm going to brag for a second. But with only $100,000 in lifetime sales at the time of the pitch, Mark Cuban invested just $150,000. Since then, Tower has done over $30 million in sales. Tower was the number one brand out of over 2 million third-party sellers signed up for the pilot Amazon Exclusives program. They also have branched into Tower Electric Bikes and Tower Beach Club, which we'll talk a little bit about also. Stefan moved his whole company to a five-hour workday and wrote a book titled The Five-Hour Workday about the experience, which would spread the idea to tens of millions of people worldwide. I think it even caught on a lot in Germany as well. Um, He founded the No Middleman Project, which is a searchable directory and online showroom for the world's best consumer products and brands. Harvard did a business school study on how they leveraged Amazon for sales. Uh, Stefan, thanks for joining me. Hey, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. So much to dig into. I mean, I want to get into the Harvard study. I want to get in No Middleman Project. Um, I want you to just to paint the picture first, what the company looked like in terms of staff, facility size at the time of the Shark Tank pitch. Before Shark Tank pitch, what did what did the company look like? Okay. <laughs> yeah, so I had just hired my first employee uh, three weeks prior to uh, Shark Tank reached out to us. This was in 2011. And they just called on the phone one day and uh, said, hey, you know, we've got this show. We'd like you to come on, you know. And I get a lot of these media calls, even with a prior company I had by PokerChips.com. I, because we're at the top of the search engines, media searches just like consumers do, and they would they would you know call, and usually that call goes, hey, we want to put you on TV, and it's going to be you know a nineteen thousand uh, dollar production fee, some some BS like that, and so I was assuming this was another call, and then the guy gets through, and I'm kind of trying to get him off the phone. And I'm like, well, I've never heard of this show Shark Tank because back then it was in season two. Was that typical never heard that they reached out to people at the time or were people reaching out to them? Early early on, I think they had to because nobody knew what the show was. Right. Um, so it was about half and half at that time. Um, but the guy's got me on the phone and he's like, yeah, it's on uh, ABC on Friday night. And I'm like, what? <laughs> How have I never heard of this show? Yes, I'll be on your show. And so uh, <laughs> six weeks later, I was, uh, you know, doing the live pitch to them. And, and then it actually aired maybe about nine months later. It was very quick. Yeah. And we were a small company. Uh, so, I mean, it was just me, one other person. And even the person that I hired was a young girl straight out of school. And I said, look, you have a job for uh, six months. And if you can figure out how to pay for yourself, uh, you can have a full time job. <laughs> Good luck. Yeah. So that's the stage we were at. So what were some of the key factors in growth after Shark Tank? Well, it um, the paddleboard market was was growing. So we were just sort of fulfilling demand. And this sort of was based on my history. I've been in the online space since 1999. Yeah. And all of the good businesses I've done have basically been, okay, find uh, demand, 
identify demand. And you can do that by seeing what people are searching for on Google and how many companies are supplying that, right? And so that's how I started the poker chip company. That's how I started the paddleboard company. I mean, the paddleboard business was, was growing 50% a year. And I kind of knew that if I come out with a direct to consumer product in that, you know, industry, and I'm basically selling half price paddleboards, that's going to be a good business. And that's what happened. And that's, uh, you know, when we got Cubans money, uh, we went into inflatable paddleboards was it was a market that was, you know, 1% of the market back then. Today, it's maybe 70% of the market. Wow. Uh, so we were able to identify that because we had a little money. We had an online business. So this uh, inflatable paddleboard that, that uh, basically rolled up like a sleeping bag and you could ship in a UPS box was a very friendly business for us. So we wanted that to be successful. And sort of we almost introduced that to the market in like a very viable uh, product format. And that's really what uh, took off, you know, our, our rocket ship growth. Yeah. Yeah. I want to talk about you know, tower paddle boards, but, um, I was looking and doing research and you've been doing the buy poker chips.com for like over a decade now. Yeah, that's, uh, since 2003. Um, and that, that business, and this is in all online businesses, you find, uh, you know, an opportunity, you go after the opportunity, things blow up, you think you're going to retire and then they sort of <laughs> slow down and then a bunch of people copy you and it, it becomes commoditized. So at the height of the poker chip, uh, you know, business. It was just a one person business, but we were doing 600,000 a year, um, you know, in revenue. And I quit my day job. I was thinking this is great today. That does about 60,000 a year. Um, you know, and I really don't focus on it because we'll do 60,000 in a day at tower paddle boards, but it's the same thing with paddle boards. Like, you know, you start it, you just don't know everything's going great. A lot of people start copying you, you know, you got the Amazon effect, you got all of these things. So you got to kind of find the next thing. Um, it, it's hard to sustain a business uh, online, a product-based business. Were you a poker player? Why, why buy PokerChips.com? I mean, I, I, I played a couple times in casinos, but I wouldn't call myself a poker player. But, you know, I played as a kid with my friends, and I'd had a poker game with a buddy at the time. And I was like, hey, you know, we should get some nice chips. And they just weren't out there. Mm. I mean, like the same types of chips you get in casinos. Right. Uh, and they weren't out there. So I, I basically, it wasn't because I was you know, super avid about being a poker player. It's yeah. I saw this market need and you know, I went into it. Same thing with the paddle boards. I mean, I'm not a huge you know, surfer paddle boarder. I mean, I enjoy it, but I'm not particularly good. But I saw an opportunity and I felt I could apply sort of an online business model that I knew. And in that business, I could see around corners because I've done the exact same thing with the, uh, the poker chips. Yeah. Well, that's the beauty of paddleboarding is you don't have to be that good. I tried it for the first time sure. with, with your board uh, over the su- past summer, actually, and I'm like, I was a little nervous, you know, and I get on, and literally there's no learning curve. You just get on, you start doing. My daughter was sitting on it, like, under my feet, and then after I was done, she's like, well, if you could do it, I could try it. And so she got on. She's seven, and she just started doing it by herself. So it, it was not much of a learning curve there. Yeah, definitely. I mean, and that was one reason I started it because uh, a buddy took me out uh, paddleboarding in, I don't know, I guess 2010. And we went out on the waves in La Jolla Shores here. And I, you know, I always sort of surfed. I lived in Hawaii when I was 18, but I'm not a good surfer. And it's, surfing is extremely hard if you've never tried it. I've never tried it. And, and I I'd, I'd think I'd be horrible at it. Yeah. <laughs> and it's just hard to catch the waves, right? On a paddleboard, it's like 10 times easier. So I'm out there on this paddleboard thinking, wow, like anybody can kind of do this. Then you could do it on flat water. And the paddleboard companies at the time were either surfing paddleboard companies or these racing paddleboard companies. And I saw this much broader market, like that anybody could get up on this, maybe not in a surf, but certainly on a bay or a lake. Totally. And nobody was focusing on this, the 80% of the market. And, you know, I could come to that percent with a direct consumer product. And, and really, you know, we're looking at the same thing in uh, the e-bike market now, like poker chips and then paddle boards. And I believe e-bikes is this sort of next market that's mm. going to explode. And, you know, we're going to attack it from a direct to consumer uh, perspective. And I think we're going to do really well. So how long does it take like for an e-bike to idea to actually launching the product? Cause now at this point you've, you've done many products. I'm sure it's, it's easier like the 12th time around, but still not easy. Yeah, you, you learn, and in dealing, uh, we're making the e-bike currently in China as well, and you learn a lot about working with uh, Chinese manufacturers and how you have to go about the process because uh, a process that could take somebody who knows what they're doing, you know, three months to six months can take somebody else two years, and you can have problems four years from now. So I know a lot of those things to avoid. 
Uh, so with the e-bike, uh, we actually came out with a regular bike. We came out with the world's finest beach cruiser. It's like a belt drive, like aluminum. Um, it's just like a stupid beach cruiser, right? And there's not much of a market for it because this would usually be a thousand dollar beach cruiser, and they sell them for one hundred twenty five dollars next door, you know. Really. But, Direct to consumer, we're selling for 500 bucks, but we made a beach cruiser that was made with components like you make on high end mountain bikes and stuff like that. Mm. Because we really wanted to understand, um, you know, bike manufacturing before you put all the electronics into it, because that's a whole nother um, section of just sort of complication, right, um, to the product. So we really dialed in the beach cruiser and we came out with an amazing, uh, you know, this amazing beach cruiser. And then we basically modeled this e bike after that and we made an e bike. That looks like a bike because the problem with e-bikes is, I mean, they got fat tires. They look like motorcycles. <laughs> it's just it's a really obnoxious product that's come onto the market. And we wanted something that people it was kind of indistinguishable from a bike. And we think that is really what's going to take off with consumers. Like you can use it as a bike. You can use it as an e-bike. And so the product development, you know, I would almost push it back two years to when we started the bike. And we did it sort of slow and methodically. I knew this market wasn't going away. Um, and then we, we got into the e-bike and it probably took us nine months. Um, and you know, the prototype was finalized. We're doing a pre-sale on that right now. And, uh, the first product will ship to consumers in January. That's exciting. Talk about the formation of the idea. So originally you think of this idea, right? How do you well, decide whether it's worth pursuing? And then are you going, I mean, obviously you have investors and you have other people probably that you bounce things off of. What did it look like to form, you know, format the, the final idea? Yeah, well, so Tower is a beach lifestyle company. Yeah. So direct consumer beach lifestyle. That's how we define ourselves. Initially, it was Tower paddleboards. And then we sort of took the paddleboards off and just said, okay, we're Tower. You know, we all live at the beach. Our offices are right by the beach. You know, what around here, what types of products can we make? So we expanded into surfboards. That was a natural expansion. Um, skateboards. Uh, we did these wood sunglasses. And uh, we did some, like, beach chairs and stuff like this. So we're doing everything around that. And beach cruisers are a big thing. So that was a natural extension. So first, I identified that, you know, electric bikes is a growing uh, consumer market. And we think these things are ridiculously expensive. So we can solve a couple problems there. Does it fit our brand? Uh, yeah, and we felt, yeah, this perfectly fits our brand, but we're going to do it from a, a Southern California beach lifestyle. So we just are doing an electric beach cruiser, basically. Um, you know, there's other companies that do mountain bikes or do like city bikes or do different types of, uh, you know, electric bikes. We're focusing on this one niche. So does it fit our thing was the first thing. And then how do you get to the, the concept that we wanted to come up with? It's, it's not just, hey, we're direct to consumer. We're going to sell the same thing that everybody else sells and you know private label something and go out with it we feel when you launch a product you go out and assess the market and see what is everybody doing here and what are they doing uh correct what are they doing incorrect what is marketing fluff and what are the the real right. sort of values in this so if i was just to research the market and say what type of bike would i want to get that's exactly what we built and so you it's, it's basically doing the research for the consumer and deciding, and then you basically manufacture from that. And this is the same thing we did in the paddleboard market. Um, you know, it's the same thing we did in the skateboard market, in the surfboard market. And the only difference here is that, you know, the electric bike market is poised for growth, where we just sort of launched skateboards, knowing it's not really a growing market. Who knows how great we'll be. The surfboard market, like, it takes a lot to get ingrained in the surfboard culture. Um, so, you know, that's just so we have a surfboard, and maybe we'll develop that in the next 10 years. Right. But the e-bikes, we felt we could take off right away. Uh, so we were a little more best. In it. This is, is another real platform that we think we can grow. Yeah. So, you know, part of it I ask, you know, I want to hear your favorite Mark Cuban story personally. But I know he talks a lot about when he's on the show and you know him personally, you know, he talks about focusing. And so I picture what he what does he say when you come to him with all these extensions, maybe he's like, go for it. But I mean, I've definitely seen him beat some people down on the show for not focusing in on one or two of what they do best. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's kind of a funny story. So after we moved to the five-hour workday in 2015, and he understood the five-hour workday when I rolled that out. You know, we also just had our first million dollar month. So I was like, hey, Mark, you know, things are going great, this, this, this. And by the way, I'm switching the whole company to a five hour work day. And here's why. And, you know, he understands that we're a beach lifestyle company. This perfectly fits our, our why. It's like work hard, play hard. 
you know, we work at the beach and we make these products that add to people's life. Uh, so our lives can be great. And by working this five hour work day, our lives are going to be even better. And then, you know, the book actually came about about a year later after we rolled it out. But the idea was we were going to spread that message as we work a five hour day. This is what our company stands for. And people, you know, you've got to have a brand here. And what I was talking about earlier with products getting commodified, unless your brand really stands for something, you're going to get lost in the in the noise. Um, so he very much understood that. I don't think he really liked the five hour work day. I don't think Mark's ever going to work a five hour work day. <laughs> and he certainly wasn't promoting it to his other companies, you know. So a lot of things that we would put out there, Mark will retweet. He doesn't want to retweet the five hour work day. <laughs> so I do not condone fan. this behavior. Yeah. <laughs> he wasn't a huge fan of that. He's not a fan of the eight hour work day. So, exactly. Um, but uh, maybe two months later, I was, you know, we were extending into these other products. And I said, hey, Mark, you know, we got this girl that came in, um, you know, to work for us in customer service. And she used to work for this sort of high end bikini company. So we're going to roll out this line of tower bikinis. <laughs> and his, his email back to me was, I think it's time for you to buy me out <laughs> because clearly you're distracted. You're working a short day. You're starting a bikini line. This is the stupidest thing I've ever heard of. You know nothing about bikinis. He's like, stick to what you know or buy me out. And I don't know if he was serious or not. It's, it's hard to tell I, I the tone. Was, but, so. Uh, so, so he doesn't like all the extensions. Yeah. Uh, when we started the bikes, um, just the regular bikes, he was like, bikes the stupidest thing to go into. Everybody makes bikes. You know, this is it's a suicide. And I was like, Mark, like I'm starting this bike because we're going into e-bikes. E-bikes is a real market with real growth that we can basically save people like 2000 bucks on an e-bike. And so then he understood that. But it's not just, you know, I throw some over the wall to him and he's like my my cheerleader. It's uh, I mean, he's pretty hardcore. Yeah. He, he doesn't mince his words. And if he likes something, I like when I pitched him the, the no middleman project, literally pitched it to him on a Saturday afternoon at like, you know, 352 or something. He responded in nine minutes. It was like a 20 page business plan. You know, the email took me three hours to write <laughs> and he responded in nine minutes, absorbed it and made some basically tweaks to the business model. He's like, well, you should do this and this and this. Hmm. I mean, <laughs> so if he likes something, he's not afraid to say he likes something. But, you know, I guess being in that position, he doesn't have to appease yeah. you. He's going to tell you what he wants. Yeah. And, and that's actually very valuable. To have. You have to make a strong argument, right? I mean, makes yeah. ma probably makes you think things through before you you send it out. Yeah. And one of the things that entrepreneurs do to themselves, and especially if you've got nobody over you, you can sort of lie to yourself and you can sort of fall in love with these things that you sort of, you know, is in your important in your little world. And if you have somebody to counter that, that's super valuable. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's hard to sometimes hear that probably that advice, but uh, it's valuable. So what were some of the tweaks? What, what did he suggest with the no middleman project? Well, with the No Middleman Project, we have, I mean, it's, everybody gets listings. All these direct consumer uh, brands get free listings within this directory. And we're basically just, yeah. you know, aggregating these brands. How do you get listed? Do you have to, do you curate it personally? Do people apply? How does it work? We, we took about a year, uh, me and one guy, it took about a year to curate these brands and just identify the best of the best. Yeah. And so now we've got 200 brands that uh, occupy maybe 1,500 product categories in this. You know, long term, it's going to be. A couple thousand brands, 10,000 categories. Yeah, I'm so looking over here. I have it open on this screen. I mean, there's some really, really, you know, you have Dollar Shade Club, you have Everlane, you have, you know, Warby Parker, you have some, like, you have Tesla on here. So you have some this really. This is the who's who of, like, totally. the new brands, the new direct-to-consumer brands out there. And, you know, some of them are a little harder to find. But people can also submit their own brands. Uh, but, yeah. That's what we're doing. What, what was the question? Will you he's... approve? I was wondering if you curate only or do you s accept applications if people want to get on oh, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, we definitely accept applications and you got to basically meet our criteria. It's got to be direct to consumer. But you were asking about what uh, Cuban's uh, you yeah. know, advice was when he saw this. Um, and so the idea is everybody's in there free. And then within each category, if there's like, you know, five, uh, you know, direct to consumer bike brands. Once you're in the category, one of those bike brands can sponsor the category at, you know, $10,000 per year per category. And they sort of get sort of exclusive, you know, banner and, you know, product ads within that category. And so the, the advertising is very limited. It's not like it's, uh, you know, th you can just sort of bid like in, in AdWords or something where there's three or four people you're advertising against. Once you have the category, you have it and you have exclusive right of that uh, refusal on having that category the next year. Mm -hmm. And 
the idea was that every year we would have this sort of, okay, here's what, here's who owns the categories. Anybody else want to, you know, bid higher? And then if somebody else bid higher, the original owner would get a match that, right? And retain it. And there were caps on the category costs. We're trying to not become a middleman. But um, that was our business model. And he's like, you got to switch this to a daily bidding thing. You don't want to have, if this thing takes off and gets rocket ship growth, you can't have every year, then you see how much you grow. Mm. He's like, you got to have basically a daily bidding. And if that company takes over the category, they get it for a year. So the you, the term of your um sponsorships can be a year but anybody at any time should be able to bid anybody else up and then you can still protect the rights of whoever you know you know ponied up and put up the money for this category they can protect their position uh, but somebody else can challenge it on sort of a daily basis because you know he knows a lot more about you know i think you know growing tower paddle boards to you know 30 million in sales in you know five or six years is fast growth but he's you know experienced growing to companies to billion dollar companies and so he sees a, a world that I don't totally. see. So that was a, an interesting thing. Any other advice uh, that he gave you on the no middleman? Um, right with that first email, he didn't. Um, so that was the that was the one critical piece. And he liked it. And he said, we should put this under tower. Um, and then uh, he, he has given me some things, some things that I like and some things that I've sort of yeah. discounted. I think sometimes he'll just have, you know, random thoughts and he'll throw it over. So. You know, initially when I was working with him, it was like anything he said, I took as gospel and I would have to do this. And now I realize he's just sort of throwing ideas. So some of them I sort of marinate on and I'll I'll do them. But, you know, he's looking at this in, you know, for three minutes at a time when he reads some article. I'm thinking about this 24 seven. Right. Um, so I can't a little different I, perspective. use his stuff. But, yeah. you know, you can't defer on everything um, or what's the what's the point? You know? What about how you've changed it from the original thought till now? Um, that has, has modified. Um, and because I'm in the middle of, of modifying it, it, I, <laughs> I can't say exactly yeah. what it was, but initially we were just going to be a directory of brands. So you got, you know, the Warby Parkers, um, you know, the, and, and this, this market has changed. So some of the direct to consumer companies like Bonobos or movement that started as the direct to consumer, they were almost the pioneers of this, um, They've act, they're actually not direct consumer brands anymore. They started and they used direct to consumer as a way to launch. Well, movement got bought got out, into, right? Uh, yeah, but even before they got bought out, yeah, they got bought out for like two hundred million dollars, and that's why they're changing. Is these people see like dollars? Like initially, it was about providing uh, customer value. You know, we're going to go direct to consumer, cut out the middleman, and we're going to provide customer value. But then once they get uh, you know a large online presence you know, the regular retailers come after them and say, hey, we'd like to sell your product. So then you sort of screw the consumer, go to retail, the retail's getting their end. You're basically back to retail. You've just started a new brand in a different manner. And this is not a small percentage of these direct to consumer brands, probably, you know, 25% uh, to a third of them. That's their path. They're direct to consumer now, but long term, they're just creating a new brand that's going to go into regular retail. With uh, nomiddleman.com, we eliminate them at that point. We're trying to focus on brands that are bringing uh, consumers better value by going direct to consumer. Because in our opinion, there is really little point for retail. Um, it's always going to play a role. Like Amazon's going to be a convenience store. Um, regular retail, you're always going to have that for your local stuff. But your truly uh, best value is going to come from these direct to consumer brands that may be represented in showrooms in local areas, but they're not going to you know, be paying 50, 40 or 50 percent to some retailer to reach yeah. consumers because they don't need them who have you taken off so far that started off direct um, consumer Bonobos and yeah. movement and it, we've had to eliminate a lot i mean i'm on the more on the business side uh, the other guy who who's actually a guy who helped me write the five-hour workday book he's the uh, you know the editor-in-chief so he runs we divided the company into he runs the editorial side and i have no say on whether he includes a company or doesn't include a company and then you know on my side i'm running more of the business side um so but we're really trying to separate that. So it really is a consumer reports uh, type thing. Mm -hmm. That's how you get in. You can't buy your way in. Mm. Um, but yeah, a lot of companies, and it's almost like sad when we have to uh, exclude them. I think Harry's Razors was another one that we had to exclude because they basically just went to retail, right? Who have you so. discovered? Like what companies have you discovered because you've probably been doing more research on direct-to-consumer that have been like a gem that you wouldn't have heard of otherwise? I mean, there's there's some like in uh, in the eyewear world, you hear of Warby Parker, but yep. then there's like another company I think called 
I buy direct. It's, it's almost like a goofy URL, not really a branding play, but they have like prescription glasses for like, you know, $16 or something like that. So whereas Warby Parker, um, they're direct to consumer, but they're really bringing uh, that high end uh, eyewear you know, value to consumers, but it's still a hundred bucks. But if you're looking at, you know, like what can you really sell uh, like plastic and metal to people for in the form of eyeglasses, you can sell it for, Fifteen, sixteen dollars right. you know, prescription, and so some of these companies are playing on the low end of the market. Some are playing on the high end of the market, and uh, some some give you a little bit of uh, both. That's kind of where Tower sort of plays. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's it's interesting and it's evolving. And every time you know I read the next issue of you know Fast Company or Inc. Magazine or you know the Internet Retailer's Top 100, I find a few more. Yeah, so it's a it's a constant uh, you know process. This is an evolving market. Yeah. So, Stefan, I kind of want to walk through this a little bit. You know, some people know exactly what you mean. They can visualize all the processes that go into direct-to-consumer. But um, you have an interesting infographic on tower paddleboards, right, which I think it does a good job explaining it. It's You talk about the manufacturer direct, you know, SUP company, right? So yeah. just walk through because this is I, I don't know. I saw it as kind of the bridge between the tower paddle boards to no middleman. This this idea that you have that you can cut out a large amount of cost and serve the the customer better because you're cutting out the cost. So can you walk through just some of that? How that happens? You know, like the tower, and then it you talk about it ships, then goes to retail, etc. Um, just briefly walk through that so people kind of understand your mindset behind the no middleman project. Yeah, and that really is the thing about um, you know direct to consumers. People don't understand what that term means. Yeah, I mean, I didn't even understand that I had a direct to consumer company in 2012 when I launched Tower Paddleboards in 2010. I I didn't have distribution because You're just trying to sell I'm, stuff. I get it. I want to try to sell stuff, <laughs> leveraging the internet exactly. And even and with the poker chips, that was direct to consumer again because I didn't have you know retail partners. Um, and if you fast forward to de- today and you talk about direct to consumer, well, people say, well, I can buy Nike's direct to consumer. I go to Nike.com or there's every brand sells direct, but that's not what direct to consumer is. Direct to consumer should really be direct to consumer only. So instead of me leveraging, you know, uh, some kind of a, a, a distributor and then a retailer and then maybe some sales reps and then maybe you know a manufacturer or even a an agent in china that represents a manufacturer you can get all the people in the middle of this process and what direct to consumer is saying we're going to get rid of all those people i mean the true direct to consumers we're going to own our own factory we're going to buy our own raw materials and then we're going to sell that direct to consumers so tower paddle ports isn't even direct to consumer because we don't actually own our fact our factory um, if we want to vertically expand, that's really where we would go. So it's this sort of spectrum. But in you know, if you look back, you know, ten years ago, before a lot of these direct consumer upstarts, there were so many layers in every commercial product. It's like if something costs you three dollars to make, that is selling for fifteen dollars in retail. And you know, once I got into sourcing products out of China in you know probably two thousand four, two thousand five, I was like, you know, it was just shocking, like what things cost. Like, you know, a hat, like a nice, you know, stretch fit, you know, hat that costs 20 bucks in retail, you know, costs $1.86 to make. Yeah. And the cheap looking hat costs $1.36 to make. So there's not that much difference in, you know, from a very high quality to a very low quality product. It's all in this distribution channel and it's all in marketing, you know, bullshit for lack of a better word of what consumers are paying for stuff. And, you know, when I, when I, you know, moved to the five hour day, a part of that was about optimizing your your work day and what you what you spend your time on but the other part of that is you should optimize how you spend money and do we need to spend four thousand dollars to get an e-bike you know when i can really buy that direct to consumer for sixteen seventeen hundred dollars so that was really it and so with the the paddleboard uh you know business i was in the paddleboard market because it was a hot market right but then i realized wait the reason i'm successful is not because i'm in the paddleboard market at the right time because there's a, a, literally 150 other brands doing that but we're kind of kicking all of their ass because we are going direct to consumer i am a direct to consumer brand first and i offer paddleboards and that's really what opened up okay well we can also offer skateboards we can offer sunglasses we can offer um, you know electric bikes and regular bikes so that's it and it's direct to consumer only and by cutting out all those people so but consumers don't know this and they're not going to know it for the next five years i would say they still think if i want the cheapest stuff i go online and i go to amazon 
that was that was actually accurate like two or three years ago but today we sell our product through amazon and to amazon and the one we sell to amazon they raise the price they sell it for 20 bucks more than us they're not even trying to undercut us right and people still buy more from that because amazon has become a convenience store um and that's that's happened with a lot of products and so now the best deals are actually you know online but off of amazon and through these direct consumer brands so that's really what the no middleman yeah. project is about is my discovery of what kind of brand we are and how that actually offers value to people the direct yeah. consumer only brand and then we need to educate consumers on this we need to make one spot where they can go and find uh you know all of the direct the truly direct to consumer companies uh direct to consumer only companies in, in an easy fashion because that's really why people use amazon and today, that's it's sort of on there. it's sort of like curating some of the best products but also the best products that that will save you the most money essentially because exactly. these people Curation. don't have the all the costs involved in their supply chain that would hike up the cost. Yeah, they don't have other people involved is the thing. Yeah. And your your term curation is exactly correct because what's happened online is, you know, there's 100,000 results for any search you do on Google and in Amazon now if you search paddle boards there's probably 500 or 1,000, you know, paddle boards or something on there. There's no curation. People don't want that. They don't need that. This is what fake news is about. It's, there's no curation. So people don't even know what's good and what's bad. What you need, I don't need to spend three days looking for an e-bike. I need to go somewhere that's going to say, these are your best three choices. I've done you know, 10 hours of research for you. You do the, the last mile here. And that's what No Middle Land is about, is curation across all product classes. So a person can literally go on there if they want eyeglasses, if they want a mattress, if they want a bike anything because you don't want to have to go to a different place for everything so that's you know aggregating all of those yeah. when you were talking i thought of 20 different questions so my mind is going crazy right <laughs> now but but one of them i want to get in the weeds a little bit um you mentioned amazon doesn't even try and undercut you they'll charge more than you so does that mean that you sell fba and vendor central they're buying directly from you and you're selling fba on amazon well uh, yeah, yeah, but we we actually pulled out of FBA. Uh, we ran into like a taxation issue with a bunch of states um, because that was giving us physical that's nexus there. That's a major there. issue. Yeah, that's a big yeah. topic too in e-commerce. It's evolving yeah. topic. Should now, Amazon now there's, there's, yeah collect the sales tax? Should they not collect the sales tax type of thing? Yeah. And we assuming they were. It was their customers. <laughs> you know, like we were unaware that they weren't even not not to not to mention we weren't aware yeah. of where they had warehouses. And it's kind of an unfair thing that these states are now coming after, and they're coming after retroactively. So they're going totally. into their Congress, making a law, saying this law applies now, and anybody who sold here owes us taxes for seven years. It's it's almost like a mob shakedown, and it's it's really. Uh, I've heard a, multiple multiple people that this yeah. has happened to. Yeah, this is it, it's really an, an incredible. It's not a small number of businesses. It's anybody who sells across state lines, this is actually protected in the Constitution. This isn't supposed to happen. But it is, and the yeah. states are, are coming after you. So, yeah. um, anyway, that's that's an aside. So, for with, with Amazon, yeah, look into we, Nexus. We don't sell yeah. in their warehouses anymore, but we we sell. We make our own listings to you know determine our own prices, and then we fulfill that through our you know San Diego warehouse now. So we're selling as a third party marketplace is what they call that, and then we're also selling Amazon retail where we sell to them, and then they go ahead and sell it. And we're testing these two two different things, and we may even be out of Amazon in not too long. Um, because you know the costs are going getting up and up and up um, to sell through Amazon, it's becoming more like a retailer. Um, so we're testing both sides of that. Um, so there's us selling our product, and there's Amazon selling our product, and Amazon sells it for a higher price, yeah. but you get it with uh, Prime, you know, free shipping. Um, so you get it in two days. Yeah. So people will pay that, but they're charging an extra twenty bucks for that. So it's not really free, <laughs> but they're charging. Yeah. It, where we were absorbing that before, and then with us. You don't have to pay sales tax, but you're going to get it in three to five days. So there's really like two two product prices on the same marketplace. Yeah. And then, so you basically are bidding against your own listing though, sort of, right? Because, yeah, but we get the sale either way. Right. Totally. But you have less control probably over that listing overall if it's Amazon is winning that that piece. A little bit. And it's a little a, bit of this tough, is it's experimentation. A tough one. Uh, yeah. A little bit of this is experimentation yeah. because we've always sold on the third-party side. 
Yeah. And then I had a friend that was doing like, you know, 50 million a year through Amazon. And he's like, no, we just sell to Amazon uh, retail. And I said, that's the dark side. Why would you sell there? And he's like, no, no, no. So, you know, and I speak at Harvard like a couple times a year now on e-commerce and selling on Amazon. And so I wanted to learn. So this is part of this is an experiment. To yeah. See what is better? Are we making more money in one? And yeah. we're, we're actually making about the same, you know? Yeah. And, no. and it's not enough because Amazon is taking too much of a cut for what they do, in my opinion. Yeah. I, I've had in the past couple of weeks, I've probably had, you know, 20 hours of conversation on this exact topic. That's why I was asking you your opinion on it. And there's mixed, mixed data and mixed thoughts from even yeah. experts on what you should do. Because on one hand, you give up control to Amazon. On the other hand, obviously, you're making money because they're selling it on their channels. And on the other hand, I mean, you lose control. So there's, there's advantages and disadvantages, I guess. But you're experimenting firsthand. Yeah. And another thing there is that, you know, you know, Amazon is kind of like, you know, riding this tiger, you know, you have them by the tail, but it's going to turn around and eat you at any point. And they just came out with uh, their own mattress company. So in the direct consumer space with, with no middleman here, you know, there's like probably 30 really viable mattress companies. And there's probably 100 direct consumer mattress companies. You know, we've got three or three to five listed on our site. Um, but, you know, Amazon is coming after them. Right. Amazon has, I think, more than 70 private label brands. That they're sort of attacking one after the other. So and, you know, this isn't about Amazon hating. I love Amazon for Christmas. I'm going to buy everything from Amazon because it's very convenient for me. And I, you know, I really don't care that much about price. But I think a lot of people do care about price. Uh, I know it's not the best deal. And so as much as I love Amazon, as much as I you know, sell through Amazon, we're, you know, a good chunk of our revenue comes through Amazon at some point. It's really not to my advantage. Like this is a competitive business environment. Amazon is trying to eat me. I'm trying to, you know, stay alive and be competitive against right. Amazon. They're making the right move. I can't fault them for it. But at some point that move doesn't serve me. Yeah. yeah. So, Stefan, talk about the Harvard Business School study. And I'm, I'm assuming this talks about um, what I mentioned in the front is being the number one brand out of over two million third party sellers. What does that what does that mean? Well, it's, you know, th this study was about, uh, I think it was uh, the time frame of it was, was about 2012, 2013, when we were, we had this fast growing company, we were already on Shark Tank, we got a little money, we got momentum. And now we have enough inventory where we can start to expand from just uh, before we couldn't just fulfill the orders that we got. Now, where do we expand? And I'd sold on Amazon before, you know, back in 2007, 2008 through Amazon, uh, the poker chip company. And Amazon had evolved quite a bit, but I knew that was next step was we're going to leverage Amazon because I knew it was a powerful channel. Um, and but the idea was, OK, you're at this decision point. Do you sell through Amazon? Um, and if you're going to sell through Amazon, do you sell to them Amazon retail? Do you sell to them Amazon uh, third party seller? And if you sell third party seller, do you get your product do you in do their FBA? warehouses? FBA, right. yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. So there's like four options there. Right. And that's how the case is laid out. Here's where this uh, company is. Here's the background. Here's the opportunity. What should they do? And then, you know, when we go in there, the professor, all the kids read the case the night before. Uh, the professor just starts firing questions and gets everybody's opinion. And then all sort of, you know, get up for the last uh, half an hour, 45 minutes and just say, here's what we did. Here's why you're correct. Here's why this wasn't correct. And then I sort of and now it's like, you know, several years later. So we're looking at this four or five years ago. Right. I'm like, this is an evolving yeah. market and vastly growing evolving totally. market changes from year to year. And the decisions that were uh, the good decisions, you know, three or four years ago are not the good decisions mm. today. So it's evolving. Like what? What was good then? What worked really well then for you to get the top? And now maybe, I mean, obviously you've kind of pulled out of FBA in general, but um, what was good then? Well, in that case, uh, paddle boards were a new uh, product on Amazon. It was a brand new category. So, you know, there were 60 products in the uh, paddle board category and we came in with 180 products. So we had, you know, 75% market share of mind share on Amazon within the paddleboard category. You know, come today, we've got rid of most of our products, the accessories and stuff like that, because we're not competitive anymore. Um, you know, add in another 100 uh, paddleboard brands are selling there. <laughs> There's a lot of confusion. And to get found, you've got to advertise now. So back then, it was pretty much a no brainer um, to go in with FBA and, you know, get into the prime people. Today, it's like, uh, you know, FBA fees have, have, have risen. You know, you got these long term storage fees. There's Amazon yeah. now understands they've got the, the pins in you a little bit. So it used to be, you know, 15 percent cost to sell through Amazon. Now it's 35, you know, and, and going north. 
So now, is it worth it at all? Yeah. Um, or should you go retail? Or should you just say, no, I'm going to be a paddleboard brand that doesn't sell on Amazon, and I've got a better value proposition. So that's those are the types of things that we're facing today. Is which way do we uh, which way do we go there? Yeah, totally. Um, I mean, you have to know something to. Not, I mean, they have a marketplace of customers, right? So you have to know something about marketing and selling online to not probably go on one of those marketplaces. So what do you do off of Amazon that helps? Yeah, I mean, we we're an SEO company. So the first three or four yeah. years, we didn't advertise. The only thing was we we leveraged Amazon maybe two years into it uh, without advertising. We were able to you know basically leverage other people's networks, what I what we call OPN, other people's networks. Yeah. Right? And if you can do that in a cost effective way or for free uh, is best. That's how you could grow. Um, so today we still uh, you know have a pretty good SEO presence. Um, you know we have an installed customer base of probably I don't know fifty thousand, hundred thousand paddleboards out there. So just just natural referrals. That's basically. A brand has been built, and it sort of rolls, rolls like a snowball down, down, snowball down the hill. Yeah, uh, we do uh, some pay per click. We do some social media advertising. Uh, we have a you know an email list with a hundred thousand people. Um, so we're doing all of that stuff. We still throw, sell through Amazon, but that's really where No Middleman came about. Is like if the cost of, of uh, acquiring a customer on um, through Google AdWords increases, and the cost of acquiring a customer uh, through Amazon increases. At some point, that's unsustainable. And so what's the, what's the future for direct-to-consumer brands? And my thought with No Middleman is we need to all throw in together here. Like if we all work together, we actually have scale that Amazon has. We have the uh, you know operational efficiency uh, that Amazon ha- has, and we can do sort of the same thing. So if I build this thing and just give everybody free leads, like that will be our future. If we can, you know, right now in product search, you basically have Google or you have Amazon. And product search is basically switched from Google to Amazon because Amazon is the everything store now. Right. What you need is a third option, you know, an everything showroom of these direct consumer brands. And I think, you know, this is a pretty ambitious plan, but there's no reason if we're offering the best value in every product category and we're we're highlighting the the best brands and it's very curated for consumers, uh, people will find that. That's why Google came to prominence. It wasn't advertising. It's just they had uh, they unearthed uh, better value and better information for yeah. people. And they rose to the top. And, and I think there's still an opportunity to do that. So long term, I think no middleman can get a percent of product search. And then that's the way forward for these direct consumer brands is, hey, we want free leads, you know, and we'll pass that savings on to consumers and consumers will pass on. You need to go to middle, no middleman as your entry point um, to find these deals. Yeah. We'll look back on this conversation when you become the new oh, Amazon. <laughs> And like, you know, if you look at Google early on, right, they said we don't, advertising is is evil, right? So at some point, No Middleman may be the new Amazon. (laughs) Well, Well, see, that's one thing that we've done because I've been in this space for almost 20 years. Totally. Yeah, I've seen that that, uh, pivot. I've even seen the pivot of a company like Bonobos saying, oh, direct to consumer, direct to consumer. And now it's uh, DNVB. Right. It's it's not about direct to consumer. (laughs) It's uh, just using online to uh, create brands. Um, so they all pivot, but with uh, no middleman, we're kind of writing this into our yeah. our, our bylaws yeah. and our. I our say it's charter. sort of joking and sort of not joking. You know, <laughs> <laughs> we want it. We want to cap this so that we can't become a middleman. And by all means, no middleman can still be a billion dollar company yeah. uh, with these caps we have in place because you're talking about the entire world of commerce. Uh, but I can give you know Tesla you know, their exclusive sponsorship category for a million dollars a year and they can sell $50 billion worth of cars. That's not really a marketing expense, right? That's just, you know, that's a small, small thing, insignificant. Yeah. So for people, and, and I notice, I, th- I think this is accurate. If you go to nomiddleman.com, it's crossed out, right? And it says really fewer middleman people, whatever the proper gender neutral term is, but um, because really it's about just shrinking the supply chain to lower costs for the customer. So who should be going to no middleman.com? So obviously consumers are looking for products that are going to be very, you know, high quality, but less expensive from the business side, from business to business, who should be going there? Is there a place for businesses to apply or how does that work from the business standpoint? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's definitely a consumer-facing site, yeah. um, and it's funny. Like the original URL was middleman.org, 
And I thought that was a great URL and I was going to go with it. And everybody says, well, you're not really a middleman. You're the no middleman. <laughs> so we, we had to register like four URLs to get to where we were going. So that was these, these, these ideas sort of come out organically and they, they develop. Um, but it's definitely a consumer facing site and that's the value. And a lot of these consumers have already bought a, you know, Casper mattress or something. And they're like, well, now I understand direct to consumer. That was an incredible deal. What is the deal in, uh, you know, bikes or sunglasses or whatever? So that's really the consumer it's for somebody that already understands direct to consumer and they go. There. Um, but on businesses, you know, when we've started pitching this to the press, I mean, uh, like writers and editors are like, this is the greatest thing ever. I mean, you've basically done all the research on this yeah. entire market that is a very hot market. So they're like, I can go into this segment, uh, this sector and see who's playing there. And so these editors and even the brands themselves to look at their competitors and look at expanding into other categories and see categories that are completely vacant. You don't mm. even sponsor a category if nobody's in there, right? I mean, we right. have nobody sponsoring any categories right now except Tower Paddleboards where it's fronting the money for this, this initiative. So we sponsor about 13 categories. Um, but there's, there's all this empty space, right? Like these, uh, these MBAs I go talk to at Harvard, like that's the number one thing these, com these kids are doing. I mean, it used to be, you know, investment banking or something like that. Every one of these kids wants to start a direct to consumer brand. They have the skills for it. A lot of them have the money for it. And it's just like pick an empty category and go after this and develop a product. And, uh, you know, you can be successful because there's so many like just voids right now. Yeah. Um, so that's I think on the business side, that's the people who are going to do it. Entrepreneurs should be looking at this and saying, there's nobody in this category. Are you kidding me? Um, you know, and, and, and attack it in that way or see categories where there's weak competition. Um, uh, yeah, and this is sort of the thing we're not trying to do. Uh, but you know, vendors, you got the bankers and the lawyers and all these, you know, marketing types and they, they want to sell into this. And, you know, this is another one of our company principles is we're never going to like, you know, aggregate these, these brands and the people within these brands and then sell them to, you know, vendors to, to take our cut. The only way we're monetizing this is the brands can sponsor their category. That's it. We're not selling access to these people, but those vendors can certainly go to our website and find out, okay, here I'm, I'm, I offer a really good marketing service to direct consumer brands. Well, here's the top 200 that are probably going to have money to pay for your services. Yeah. What so have you, there's a lot of people that can use it. Yeah, totally. Um, so, you know, the website, if anyone has not figured out, nomiddleman.com. Um, and what have you learned from Harvard? You know, being a Harvard Business School study, you get a lot of input from really smart students, really smart professors. What have you learned from being one of their studies? I mean, the most interesting thing was the first time I went there is how, uh, like, multicultural um, Harvard Business School is. I mean, it was it was shocking. And, you know, the first time I spoke there was really in the, sort of the Trump election run up. And <laughs> I was going to, you know, an elite school and it's every culture and every I mean, it's it's almost like shocking, like how I mean, that, that was just amazing to me. Um, and then these are these are really, you know, bright kids. So it was just interesting to get, you know, their input on, you know, our business, not just Amazon, but, you know, how to grow a brand and how to do something mm. like that. So I actually you know, I go out there for free. I'm not paid to go out there. I have a buddy in Boston that I stay with and he's a, you know, a good buddy. So I use it as an excuse to see him, right. but it's a learning experience for me to just get in a room with smart people. And basically it's almost like a mastermind. You, you sort of are bouncing these ideas off of the, the kids. And a lot of these, um, you know, these are kids that are in school. And so they're looking at this from a very academic perspective and they're like, Oh, well, you do your business plan and then you go raise, you know, five million dollars and then you do this and you do this. And I'm like, that's not really how it works. You're like, work. my business you plan make payroll. didn't start <laughs> off. I'm going to pitch on Shark Tank. <laughs> like, that wasn't part of your original business plan. Exactly. I mean, you got to they don't understand cash flow and survival is, you know, number one, even, you know, five, six years into this. It's still like. OK, you know, how, how are we going to uh, if this dies and this doesn't take off, we can still go out of business, you know, and people yeah. don't understand that. Um, yeah, it's not just an academic exercise. It's, a, it's an exercise in survival and sort of persistence and sort of stubbornness to stay alive in business. And then you find these little pockets of things like the e-bikes where, yeah. boom, you're going to have this huge growth for a while until yeah. everybody figures it out and copies you. Um, well, that's sort of the beast also of a physical products company, because the more you sell, the more you have to invest to produce more product. Like with the no middleman, hopefully, you know, that if it's more of a digital property, it's 
you know, you don't have an overhead, this whole supply chain that's in in place, yeah. right? Yeah, there's, there's, there's easier and harder businesses. I remember when I was coming out of undergrad, I was, uh, I'd, I'd international traveled, you know, Australia for three months and went to Europe. And I decided I was going to start this traveler bus company across the U.S. And I had one of my buddy's dads or my dad's buddies over for dinner. And I was explaining to him this this business, this busing business. So I'm going to have all these buses and all over the country and I'm going to be coordinating this at these hostels. And he's like, he's like, dude, like there's hard businesses and there's easy businesses. And that is a hard business. <laughs> he's like, you got a lot of moving parts. You got all these employees in remote locations. You got, you know, gas prices are going to go around. You know, you could have it. He's like, that's a nightmare business. And that's kind of what I've learned in doing businesses. I mean, even with the paddleboard business, like we have hard paddleboards uh, are, you know, 12 feet long, three feet wide. Talking about shipping those freight. thing. Yeah. yeah. And if someone, if, if it breaks, they got to ship it back. It's $150 each way, right? <laughs> nightmare business. Inflatable paddleboards. I can ship it by UPS. I can ship it anywhere in the world. And usually it's 25 bucks to, to wherever. That's a good business, right? Uh, you know, and then you take like, you know, businesses like Google or Facebook or stuff like this with these network effects. Um, these are really good businesses. Right? So there's there's a big spectrum there. And obviously, no middleman is not a product based business. Um, and there's a lot of, uh, you know, efficiencies there. But it's it's also that chicken before the egg thing. Like, yeah, you know, you've you got to build the traffic before that. Before, yeah, totally. So talk. I love what I love is lumpy mail large packages people are guaranteed to open them and you i'm curious and i know we talked a little before we started about what do you put in the box with the board or whatever you ship you put some stuff in the box right with the book and like talk about some of the thought that goes behind what you put in the box yeah we're not that advanced on the marketing we probably should be putting a lot more but the one you know insight that we had is when we wrote this book we're like how are we going to get people to read this book well this book is about our company and about our brand and what we stand for I'm like, let's put a book in every you know package. And then I thought, ooh, this is going to be expensive. But if you print the books 5000 at a time, I think it costs us like a dollar, you know, maybe a dollar eighty, dollar ninety mm. uh, per book. You know, hard cover, hard cover, cover That's a good. really nice yeah. book. So that I'm should be like, on nomiddleman.com. What's that for books? <laughs> oh, yeah. How cheap they really are. Yeah, that's a book that sells for twenty five dollars <laughs> in your local store. And the funny thing is, the paperback is you know pennies cheaper <laughs> than the hardback yeah but in, in retail stores hardbacks are 30 bucks and paperbacks yeah. are 12.99 yeah. it makes no sense. sorry i had to digress um, to no middleman but go on <laughs> with what you put in the box. so so that's what we put in the um you know in every you know board that goes out every package even if it's not a board we just we stuff a book in because it's an extra two dollar cost but it, it is spreading that message and what's happened there is this this book and the book itself um you know the five hour workday really got a ton of press when we uh, when we put it out there, because, you know, aside from our company, most people don't even know anything about our company when they read that book. They're just like, ah, this American company, they did this test in real life. It's not just an academic exercise and see how this would work. And so, you know, we got press in 20 countries. I think I was did like, you know, five or six national uh, TV shows and, and stuff like that amazing. in yeah. the U.S., um, but now that, you know, probably 20,000 people have this book, maybe 30,000 because we're putting one in every thing. And then we got people buying the books as well. It's starting to snowball itself. And so we have an email list, um, you know, at fivehourworkday.com that people sign up for. And it used to get, I'd see one or two or three emails, uh, you know, sign up a week. It was nothing. And I wasn't like trying to do it. I just wrote this book. We're using it to leverage for tower paddle boards. But now I'm getting, you know, five to seven emails a day are signing up for this. So this thing is starting to snowball on its own. And if that happens, you know, I think sort of the, the brand halo of that can really positively affect, uh, you know, tower. And that was the whole thing of including this. You're going to get this in enough hands that the idea will eventually spread. And I think that's it's a similar concept on No Middleman, too. And we I have a book planned for that. And it's basically going to be a roadmap for how, you know, an entrepreneur would start a direct consumer brand. And I'm going to give sort of all of my secrets of how that's done. And that's going to be half the book. The other half is going to be sort of what is the direct consumer revolution? What is the history of retail? And why in 20 years from now is this the winner? Why is the puck going here? Um, So it'll be sort of an academic book in a sense. And consumers can sort of understand like, wow, am I really paying twice as much for everything? And is there a smarter way for me to shop? Imagine if I just had to work half as much and I could get the same stuff if I'm smart. Because we've become such a consumerist like economy. 
and it, people just pay for stuff to you know pay for stuff bottle service i mean you pay a thousand dollars for a you know a bottle of uh, vodka and a table and the people that runs those clubs they're laughing i mean they're laughing at you i've, I've talked to people who own casinos in las vegas and they said you know, it used to be we made 70 percent of our money on gaming and then, you know, 30 percent. And we gave away basically hotels and food and everything like that. That model is flipped. They make 70 percent on these nightclubs and food. And they're like any these idiots will pay anything. I mean, people that wouldn't pay seven dollars for a drink 10 years ago are now more than willing to pay a thousand dollars for a bottle. You know, and these are not wealthy people. These are people that that's their rent payment. You know, right. It's crazy. So business people are taking advantage of consumers because consumer uh, consumerism is so rampant. And I think there's going to be a reaction to that at some point. Yeah. So the five hour workday talk about, for, first of all, people should check it out. Um, I was trying to convince you subtly to do, do an audible version when we, before we started, cause I would, I would <laughs> no, for sure <laughs> consume it in like the next two days. If it was there, I just know sometimes <laughs> that's just more of my style, uh, of listening. But what were some, uh, you know, before they check out the book, um, what was like one or two tests that you, um, did within the company? So uh, essentially, the, the five-hour workday book, it wasn't like we planned a book. We just moved the company to a five-hour workday in 2015. Um, and this is kind of how I'd been working for the last uh, 10 years probably at the time, was coming to work uh, and do what I need to do and get out of there, right? And it, a lot of times, I was the only person in this company. So if I needed, you know, I have a son, if I needed to take a two-week vacation, I was designing my business so that I could, you know, walk away from that. And uh, I mean, a lot of it was based on Tim Ferriss's, you know, four-hour work week. And that was how an, an entrepreneur, an individual, could sort of get a bunch of you know other people doing his work for him, outsourcers and stuff like that, automate processes and, and stuff like that. And so that's how I was working, and I was being very successful with it. And a lot of my entrepreneurial uh, you know friends were working in that fashion. And I looked kind of at everybody else in the economy and a lot of these you know corporations that were struggling, and I'm like, why isn't everybody working like this? And then I thought, well, Jesus, you have a company and, you know, you have all you're working startup hours and you're, you're pushing these guys. Like, why don't you give them the same incentives that you have as an entrepreneur? And so uh, I was like, I think it was June 1st in 2015. You know, I walked in and I said, like, look, OK, we're going to move to a five hour workday. It's going to be 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. straight through. There's going to be no lunch. And I want everybody here to basically figure out how to do your jobs. So. Here's the, here's the give and take. I'm going to give you your life back. You're literally going to walk out the door at one o'clock. That's going to change your life. You're going to have a work week that's better than most people's, you know, vacation. And then you still have weekends. Um, but on the, the ask side is, you know, uh, no more fantasy football at work. Uh, no more online shopping at work. Uh, I don't want you screwing around on Facebook. You're not going to have enough time. If you do that stuff, you're probably going to get fired because, you know, your work's not going to do. Yeah. And if you basically can't do the same thing you were doing before or more, you're going to be fired. So I'm going to give you basically the incentive uh, package that an entrepreneur has. Um, you have to perform. And if you can't perform and condense your time, uh, you'll be fired. And if you can do it, you're going to have your life back. And it wasn't just about uh, incentivizing my existing staff, but it was about uh, what's my staff going to look like five years from now. I want to be able to attract all of the people that work at three times the speed of everybody else. But in most companies, uh, you know, they make 20 percent more than the rest of the people and they carry the, the workload. So I wanted to repel the people mm. uh, that were sort of sloth like and get all of these high performers into my company. Mm. And so that was the thing. And we were going to do a three month test was the idea. And well, I was going to see who were my uh, high performers and who were not my high performers. Yeah. And, uh, you know, then I'd sort of clean house. And after three months, it was working so well that we just sort of kept it on. And it uh, it just continued. Um, it. Uh, that was the, the general idea. And there was no, uh, you know, this is a critique that the book gets a lot. It's like, okay, well, you explain this process and you went in here and you showed what happened with your company. Uh, but, but tell me, what do I need to do to work this five hour workday? Well, it really depends on your job. And we didn't bring in an efficiency expert and analyze our shipping function or analyze our retail function or anim analyze how the customer service people were doing or analyze what the marketing people were doing. Everybody did what became their own efficiency expert. And I just said, well, figure it out. Just examine, spend a couple hours of your day examining yeah. how you're working. And are, are there things that you can just stop doing and, and, right. and they would work better? And so that is the magic. It's putting pressure on people. It's no different than, you know, finals week in, in college. All of a sudden, you know, that 45 page paper that you, you know, couldn't write all semester gets done in 24 hours. 
um, because there's time pressure. And without that time pressure, yeah. uh, people just fill voids. And this is what's been going on in the last 40 years in, in America and probably around the world is all this technology has been thrown at us. And suddenly, you know, we're working the same hours and not getting we're getting, a, you know, a minimal more productivity than, you know, my mom was working in a, in a bank with a typewriter, um, you know, mailing letters. Right. And, right. you know, it's crazy. Like we should be 100 times more productive than them. And the entrepreneurs in the world are and the other people aren't. So you need to yeah. put time pressure on organizations and companies um, at large. Totally. I mean, I think I'm not sure if it's Parkinson's law, but. I think it's Parkinson's law. Basically, you have a space, and you will just fill up the space because sure. it's there. But the same thing goes with time, right? And I think I don't know if you said this or it's in the book or both, but I think you said the shipping time went from five minutes to like two point six minutes. And it's not like yeah. you gave them specific direction on what to do; they just figured it out. Exactly. <laughs> I'm like, why haven't we done this before? You know. But they were just, and that's the funny thing is the shipping people were kind of looking at me when I sort of made the announcement that we're going to move to this, like, uh, I understand how that might work for you guys. Uh, you know, they're staring computers here, but it's not really going to work for us. But the, the thing is, we didn't even have to get any new tools, any new software. They basically you, you learned to use and utilize the software they had to its full capacity, which they just hadn't done before because there just was no pressure there because these guys could literally go surfing at one o'clock if they wanted to. That was huge motivation for them. Right. So they're like, we don't have to clock hours here. Let's get this stuff done. How can we do this faster? Let's, you know, get a little pep in our step. And some of it is is identifying tools that make your work faster. Some of it is just working at a faster clip. And the other part is just eliminating waste. And between all three of those people, all three of those things, I mean, before we were working, uh, you know, a nine to five day with an hour lunch, that's really a seven hour day. You know, even though I said we're startup hours, that was a seven hour day. And then there's time wasted before lunch and after lunch. So we really only reduced a seven hour day to five hour days, but we did it such that we put lunch after work um, and you eliminated waste around lunch. I mean, that is a very easy thing to do. So it's not too surprising. We were barely working less really. And we were, you know, but we were focused on efficiency. What, I don't know if you get this question, but so like customer service and everything like that, you guys do a really good job with, but then what happens after one? People are calling, yeah. people are emailing. What What do you do after that? Do you just have a second shift or something of people? You have the second. <laughs> <laughs> See, this is, this is, it's a funny question yeah. because people assume like in today's world, like, you know, I had buddies before we even did this, like you need to get a call center answering the phone 24 hours a day. And I'm like, no, we're not 7-Eleven. You know, we're not like the all-night, uh, you know, lumber store. I want my paddleboard like, now. I don't care if it's like, midnight. Exactly. I want People to be able to buy a paddleboard every five years. <laughs> like, it's not that urgent. And most right. businesses in the world are just not that urgent. And you're kidding yourself. And so, yeah, we can man the phone 16 hours a day, and we're going to get an incremental, uh, yeah. you know, better experience for the customer and an incremental more of sales. But Maybe if you cut it to five, you only lose 5% of the sales and you piss off a few people that are kind of unrealistic in what kind of customer expectations. Nobody cared. So you found it I didn't mean, really it, make a difference. It didn't. It didn't. Like eight hours is totally arbitrary. And this is the thing I talk about in the book. It goes over the history of, um, you know, the work hour. And basically the eight hour day was invented in like, you know, 1913. It was just. Somebody just magically invented this, and then we all just sort of went along with it. <laughs> you know why they invented it? Yeah. They invented it because all of a sudden you had the Industrial Revolution, and you have these machines that can work 24 hours a day. And productivity went through the roof. And what happened is oh, people tried to keep up with the machines. And then they were working 12-hour days, and they were working 16-hour days. People were dying and getting maimed on the factory floors. And they said, this is un unstable because I'm, my workers are dying, basically, right? getting hurt. So they said, okay, a more sensible way here is we're going to have three shifts of eight-hour days. So the machines will work full-time, and then we'll rotate people around this clock. That's where the eight-hour workday came from. Mm. Now, why in the hell is a lawyer or a, you know, a marketing agency using an eight-hour day? Makes no sense at all. Nobody's, nobody's just sat back and thought, like, what would be the optimal uh, day for us to work? We just uh, let's go with these factory workers from 100 years ago. Right. That um, makes perfect it, sense. <laughs> it makes no sense. <laughs> Nobody works in a factory anymore. Totally. In the U.S. 
So, Stefan, first of all, thank you. I really appreciate your time. I have two last questions. Um, everyone should check out TowerPaddleBoards.com, NoMiddleman.com, 5HourWorkday.com, and check out what they're doing because whatever you're doing, it's, it's innovating. It's trying to stay ahead of where the puck is going and everything like that. So thank you for sharing. This has been really valuable. Um, I always ask, uh, since it's Inspired Insider, what's been a low moment? And what's been a proud moment? Um, because, you know, in companies, it's not always just sunshine. You know, there's like you have to make payroll. You have to actually make tough decisions. What's been a, a tough moment that you had to push through? I mean, we're, we're kind of going through a tough moment now with this whole um, the Internet sales tax um, you know, issue that's come up. Because we essentially have, you know, states coming after us and saying, you know, you owe us a sales tax that you didn't collect from consumers that you didn't know, you know, another company wasn't collecting. And it's it's just there's there's as any business when you start out in the online space, it was very simple. It's a very simple business. You know, we get to the top of the SEO, we get there, we have paddle boards. But as businesses go along, the complexity adds to it. And now you've got e-commerce that's going along and a lot of unnecessary complexity is being added to it. And one of those things is with the sales tax thing. Like I, as a, as a, you know, a business owner, you know, pay my taxes. I do that. I have no problem with that. I'm more than happy. I'm more than happy to, you know, tomorrow collect tax from everybody in the country. And that's kind of what we're being forced to do now. But now we have to hire two people to figure out what tax to collect in 9,000 different tax jurisdictions around, you know, 50 different states. We have to register in 50 different states yeah. and we have to report, you know, monthly in this state court. It's just, it's an insane like thing. Like if you want me to collect tax, just let's have one tax, national sales tax, I'll submit it. And then you can just split it among your states, like make it simple. So now you have to spend so much time doing those things. And then with online marketing too, there's so many different online marketing channels. You got Facebook, you got LinkedIn, you got Instagram, you've got AdWords. Now you've got these content delivery networks, and then you've got video, and then you've got all of this stuff. So now you got to bring in, you know, experts, and then the experts come in. And this is like, you know, uh, the doctor and lawyer problem is that, you know, now they're going to charge you five hundred dollars an hour to, uh, you know, do these complex things that you're not smart enough to do. And that to me is annoying. And that's not about uh, business is is creating value, right? And, I think a lot of the whoever complete creates complexity in this stuff is uh, <laughs> is uh, it's just it's counterintuitive to creating new products and stuff like that, and it's it's annoying to me. So when when a business gets like that, I'm kind of like you know this yeah. isn't a business that I want to I want to be in. Um, so I try to bring uh, simplicity uh, back into things. Um, so. Yeah, that's, you do it that's, for that's one of the consumer. depressing things about. Yeah, you do it for the end consumer, and then all these other complexities get thrown in, and it doesn't allow you to do what you set out to do, essentially. Yeah, and yeah. that that to me is that to me is frustrating, yeah, and that's part of the no middleman thing. Is I want to bring you know I don't want to have to look at a hundred different you know e bike companies. I want to look at three. I want simplicity, and I think a lot of people are getting that way. The, the world yeah. is getting a lot more complex. And yeah, we can have artificial, you know, intelligence run the whole thing, but maybe just simplify some things, you know, yeah. like here in California, we have uh, in and out Burger, you know, you got three menu items. Right. <laughs> There's beauty. There's beauty in that business model to me. Totally. And then proud moment. What's been especially proud moment for you? Um, I don't know. I think the, being on the Inc. 500. Um, was really sort of a proud moment because that's when I like, got out of college. That's how I looked for a job. I got the Inc. 500 and I just went down those companies and I looked, well, what companies are in my town? And I just walked in there and said, I'll work for free for you because, you know, you're doing something, you're going somewhere. And uh, it never really occurred to me that I would have a company that, that wasn't any kind of 500 company that I started myself. So that was a, yeah. that was a pretty, you know, proud moment. Yeah. Stefan, first one to thank you. This has been fantastic. Everyone should check out all the websites I mentioned and uh, really appreciate your time. Hey, thanks. Thank you much. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.